Vale, hola, buenos días, bienvenidos a, a esta charla que tenemos en el Nate Café con el director Kevin McDonald. Estamos muy orgullosos. Eh, la, esta entrevista la sostenemos, la sostendrá con Marisol García, la directora de comunicaciones del festival, periodista eh, cultural y musical específicamente. Al final de la charla van a haber espacio para preguntas y respuestas, que la pueden hacer en, en inglés o en castellano, ningún problema. Eh, les quería comentar que la película de Marley se va a dar hoy día en el cine Hoyts, a las 10 de la noche. ¿Vale? Y que bueno, que sí, el festival continúa hasta el próximo domingo, así que para que entren en la web, eh, wwwinedit nescafé Y bueno, también queremos darle las gracias a la Facultad de Comunicaciones de la Pontificia Universidad Católica, el, el señor Fernando Acuña va a venir aquí también a presentar y a decir unas palabras porque esto es una acción conjunta entre el festival y la Universidad Católica. Fernando. No, a ustedes. Eh, bienvenidos nuevamente a la Facultad de Comunicaciones de la Universidad Católica. Esperamos trabajar eh, el próximo año y todos los años siguientes con Inedit, eh, este festival que se ha ganado un espacio eh, en el panorama nacional de festivales y muestras eh, y queremos acogerlos, ojalá, eh, con invitados tan interesantes como el que tenemos hoy. Eh, bienvenidos y disfruten el festival y disfruten de la conferencia de hoy. Muchas gracias. Hola. Hello, Kevin. Hello. Um, if one looks at your filmography, there's two peculiarities probably. One is uh, that even though you're quite young, 46, right? 45. 45 years old. <laughs> you already have about 20 or more films. Mm. Um, so you've been very fast mm. uh, making them. And the other one is that you've been between these two um, sort of worlds, you know, like fiction and fact. And even when you work with documentaries, you work them as if they were like fiction films, mm -hmm. most of the time, mm -hmm. most of the fi films. And when you do work on fiction films, they always have some kind of historical uh, root. Mm -hmm. If you could talk a little about that, um, maybe your own thoughts, first about your productivity, You didn't study filmmaking, did you? No. Uh, uh -huh. Well, first of all, I'm very glad to think that at 45, I can still be described as young. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that um, I started, I, I studied English literature, and so I had nothing to do with film, but I wanted to be a journalist. Yes. And I couldn't get a job as a journalist because there was a big recession in, in Britain in the early 1990s when I graduated. Were you thinking about written journalism or...? Written TV? journalism, okay. written journalism. And so I did two things. One, I bought myself a little camera, one of the earliest uh, home video cameras that recorded reasonable sound and reasonable picture. And I started making little films for fun, documentary films. This was on the 90s, 80s? Yes, 92, okay. maybe, 90, 91, 92, 93. And Uh, it was called a Hi8 camera. I'm, I'm sure everyone here is too young to remember Hi8, but it came before DV. I do remember. Which came before HD. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I started just for fun making these films, and one of those films, a little short 10-minute film, got seen by somebody at the BBC, and they asked me to make a little documentary, and one thing led to another. I started making small documentaries. And at the same time, I wrote a book, um, I, had, I, I have a uh, film heritage. My grandfather was a Hungarian Jewish uh, filmmaker who came to England escaping Nazism. Very uh, prestigious. And, uh, and he was, is now considered to be a, you know, one of the great British filmmakers. Yes. Um, and he died when I was just le leaving university. And I thought I'm going to write a book about him because his life was so interesting and extraordinary. So I, in writing this book, I traveled around Eastern Europe I, to, in Berlin. And I had to watch a lot of movies to understand where he came from and what he was doing as a, as a filmmaker. And in watching all these films, I became more and more interested in film. Before that, I hadn't really been that interested. So in writing the book about my grandfather, I suppose I developed an interest in film, which coincided with making 
little home movies, home videos um, at home. So I started making documentaries uh, for television, mostly documentaries about artists. And then I got fed up with making those and wanted to make a documentary for the cinema. And I, I, I looked around for a subject. I then wrote another book about documentaries called Imagining Reality, which is a history of documentaries. And through learning about other documentaries, I started to see possibilities for what I could do to make documentary for the cinema, to make documentaries that were as exciting, stimulating, emotional as fiction films in okay. some way, but were true stories. And that's, that's really when I suppose my film career took off. I, st I, I made a film called One Day in September, yes. which uh, was a, a controversial film when it came out, and it, it won the Oscar for Best Film that year, Best Documentary that year. And uh, from then I started making other documentaries for the cinema, and I also started doing drama as well, making dramatic films. Before that, did you ever feel that you lack a more formal preparation? Have you ever missed that? Of course, um, of course I have, but uh, um, I would love to have spent three years learning the, the technical intricacies of filmmaking, um, but... You're not being ironic. No, <laughs> I'm not being ironic. I would, like to, I would like to, because I think it's a great opportunity to really experiment and to fail, which is the great thing about being a film student. You can, you can try things that don't work. When you get into the professional world, if it doesn't work, it's a big problem. So people don't experiment very much. And I think uh, one of the things I've, I think I'm quite brave in what I do. I'm, I'm not so worried about failure. And so I will try lots of different mm -hmm. types of things, whether it be in drama or whether it be in documentary, different sorts of films. And I think out of that comes, out of the willingness to experiment come interesting films sometimes. Sometimes they don't work, sometimes they aren't good, but mm -hmm. uh, at least you're trying to do something different. And um, maybe it's part of my character to be easily bored. I don't want to repeat myself and do the same the same kind of thing. I don't want to be the best person at making mountain climbing documentaries. I've made one mountain climbing documentary, and that was enough, and mm -hmm. then I'll do other things. Uh, life is so rich and interesting, why, why limit yourself? Um, yeah. But I, 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 um, my advice always to people who, who want to make films is not to worry too much about technique, uh -huh. because certainly for me, I'm still learning technique. Uh, but technique is, is, is not everything. It's only part of filmmaking, a small part in a way. If you work with people who know what they're doing, if you work with great cinematographers or musicians, they can, they can bring things to you, they can bring technique to you. Uh, the most important thing when making a film is to have an idea that's interesting in and a story that's interesting to tell, that's worth telling, and then you will find a way to do it. In most of your interviews, you you say the word curiosity, how important yes. curiosity has, has yes. been for you. Yes, well, I think um, most documentary makers are curious people because we want to understand how other people live their lives and the, why they've made the decisions they've made and ask the questions, how did that happen? Why did that happen? And having a camera present enables you to be curious and nosy, to be... Um, asking the kind of intimate questions to people that in a social situation you never could. When you have a camera there in front of you, it's, 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 uh, uh, it, makes, it makes, you, makes you able to ask questions that maybe only your therapist would be able to ask you. Mm. <laughs> and it makes it socially acceptable to do so. So for somebody who's nosy, who's curious, doing documentaries is the perfect profession. <laughs> part, of the, part of the work of our documentaries is to get people to talk. First mm. of all, search people. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, get, to, get to see where they are and see if they want to talk and then um, approach them in a confident way, I guess. Is yes. that, you feel, part of your job or is that part of the production team work? How have you approached it so far? It varies from, from, from film to film, but I think in general that is, in the kinds of films that I make, that's the big skill, persuading people to talk to you and then persuading them to be open and honest with you and not to be overly challenging to people but also not to let them get away with lying to you. So I think it often helps not to be a very um, abrasive 
aggressive person, but to be somebody who is genuinely interested in what people have to say. And you can tell in a conversation if somebody's interested in you or if they're just going through the motions. Are you patient? Can you wait for a year I'm or very patient. I'm very patient. I think you have to be. In the interview, in the film I just did about Bob Marley, we waited for a year for some people to say yes to being interviewed. Uh, and one of the risks of documentary is that you can start filming a subject and you never know if people are going to turn around and say, I don't want you to film anymore. Mm -hmm. Or uh, you wait for a year and they don't do the interview. So uh, um, you, always have to, uh, you always have to take a huge risk. You always have to, you have to jump off the cliff, decide you're going to make the film, but you don't know if your parachute's going to open. What's your regular approach? First an email maybe, then a phone call? It sort of depends who it, 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 depends who it is. Um, there's no doubt that direct contact is what I try to get. You try to meet people as early as possible to talk to them. Uh, and you find that most people, if they don't say no to you absolutely 100% and the first time you talk to them, then you know you're, they're going to eventually say yes. And very, very few people say no 100%. Uh -huh. they, they, you speak to them and they leave you a little window. Call me back maybe in a month. Or, no, I could never do that if such and such was happening. If there's an if or a but, then you know you have them. Eventually, they'll, they'll do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a, we're all at heart egomaniacs. All people, all, all of us want to be appreciated and understood. So that's the great uh, friend of the documentary maker, is ego in other people and narcissism that really most people, if you make them feel comfortable and make them feel they're important, they want to share their lives. Mm -hmm. There's another part of preparing a documentary which has to do with investigation. Do you usually read a lot? I was, I was for example, um, reading yesterday that for the state of play, mm -hmm. uh, you decided to go to the Washington Post newsroom mm -hmm. and stay there for Mm -hmm. a whole day or something, mm -hmm. along with Brad Pitt. Well, that's another story, what <laughs> happened with Brad, Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's something that you take very seriously, right? Go to the places that you have to work yes, on. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, it depends what kind of documentary you're making. I mean, the, you know, I'm talking about the kind of films that I make, which are usually analysis of people's characters or retrospective histories of things or, or reanalyzing something that happened in the recent past. There obviously, there are many types of documentaries. There are poetic documentaries. There are documentaries which are um, uh, observational, where you just observe a character over a long period. Um, I think documentary can be so many different things. Or experimental. Or it can be experimental. Um, I made an experimental film, which was shown last night, called right. Life in a Day, which is, it's, it's uh, I guess, a film which um, has no narrative at all. Uh, and no directorial control, so it's, it's and no really comparison. an expert. Yes, <laughs> so, so, um, but I think there's many types of documentaries. But yes, in, in most of the films that I make, um, I like to do a lot of research, and also for the, for the fiction films that I do. I like to really imagine what is it like. I made a film in, set in Roman Britain, so in a Roman time in, in, in England, and I read as much as I could. I, went to the museums, you know, to really find out what would somebody look like in Roman times, how would they really act, how would they, what would they, what sword would they use? So to try and make those things authentic, because to me, if you manage to make something feel real and convincing, the audience is immediately recognizing that and sucked into the story, um, even if the story is fictional. So when I made State of Play, which is a film, of a, 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 a Hollywood movie, a Hollywood production um, about journalism, and a kind of conspiracy theory. Um, I was uh, interested to, to, to really address some real issues about journalism and the, and the crisis affecting journalism internationally at the moment, even within the context of a Hollywood entertainment film. So I spent a lot of time with journalists. I think weeks at the Washington Post, I met lots of investigative journalists. And I think some of that rubs off mm -hmm. into, the, into the film. And um, it's interesting. It's not the way. It's not the usual Hollywood way of approaching things. Yeah, so most of the directors, I would guess, leave that work to the scriptwriter. Yes, you're very much. But I into think that I think that if you that most that most good directors, I think, are 
involved in the script in a very in a fiction film in, uh -huh. a, in a very detailed way. I don't take a credit for writing the scripts, but all of the scripts that all the films I've worked on, I have written quite a lot of the material. I've researched the material, and I work with the writer. And I'm not good at writing dialogue, for instance, but I will say I want a scene like this, right. and uh, where they say something like this, and I'll give them the bad version of the dialogue, and then they go away and they mm -hmm. try and find the the nice way of writing it. You just said that uh, One Day in September was like your first big documentary. Yes. Uh, and then it got an Oscar. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't that intimidating in a way? Um, no, it was fun. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a very strange... Completely um, unexpected, right? Very unexpected, yeah. Um, I think the film, the film was... Um, uh, Besides, you were like 30... Yeah, I was very young, 31 or something. Right. And I think the film really touched a nerve with people because what it tried to do was, the, I had a concept for it, which was, I want to make a documentary that works like a thriller. Yes. So I want it to be, the story to be told in the way that you would in a, in a Hollywood thriller, but it, everything to be real. And we found some amazing, n never before found out information about this, this huge terrorist attack. And there was, a, there was a genuine conspiracy, I think, about what had happened there. And we'd uncovered the conspiracy. So there was a interest, very interesting story. Um, but I think what the impact of that film and the influence of that film was that it took a new approach to how to use documentary material. But a lot of people within the documentary world, a lot of people within the traditional documentary world were shocked by this film, appalled by it, because they felt it was trying too hard to be entertaining, that it was trying, that it was manipulating maybe the the, the information too much, okay. and uh, I think that the influence of that film has been quite great in terms of uh, uh, television documentaries, which are now told often in this way with m music going in the yeah. background and excitement and da -da 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 -da. and uh, I think that I, I agree with the <laughs> conventional critics who said that at the time that this was a terrible direction for a documentary to go, and they're probably right, I think, but you know. You can only know that in retrospect. They would see it as frivolous, or maybe. Uh, I don't think frivolous. Maybe frivolous. Maybe that's the maybe that's the word. But I, I think um, they felt there was too much of the tropes and styli stylizations I of see. fiction film being brought into uh, nonfiction. Which was intentionally. Which was very intentional. Okay. Yes, and I think for me, as a, I think as a film, uh, as an experiment in trying to do that, it's a it's a good example. It really works. But um, what I didn't realize was that uh, in now, 15 years later, that that kind of style is everywhere, certainly in America and in Britain. I don't know here what happens uh -huh. here. But, um, uh, and maybe that's, that, that has gone too far, that style. How is it to win an Oscar? Uh, surreal, strange. You know, you come from the world of documentaries where nobody really pays any attention to you, you're nobody, you're patronized by people in the f in the <laughs> in the f who are fiction filmmakers, and uh, you work alone and, you know, with two, three other people for years on something, and then you find yourself in Hollywood on the biggest night of the year uh, for Hollywood where, you know, sitting in, f sitting in front of you is Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep, and it's quite a, an odd, feeling and for 24 hours you're made to feel like you're royalty and then the next day you're nobody again you're just a documentary maker <laughs> but then in terms of your production does it really help uh, what what well what you know the thing mean? about the thing about winning an oscar is that first of all i i think that there is no doubt that winning uh, any award is is no reflection really on the quality of your work I think the best films I've made have not won anything at all. Um, it's a lot to do with luck and to do with politics and to do all, yeah, all of those sorts of things. And so I don't think just because you win the Oscar, it's, it's, it, it ref means that that film you've made is, is wonderful. A lot of things win awards that don't, don't. So that's one thing. But the second thing is that particularly in America, uh, which until recently, I guess, was the heart of financing a film. So it's important if you're a filmmaker in America. Um, having an Oscar is like in England being knighted by the Queen, you know, mm -hmm. when she takes her sword. 
and then you're known as Sir Kevin MacDonald. Um, Which hasn't happened it changed, to you yet. No, it hasn't happened to me. <laughs> but it's the similar kind of thing because in America, every time my name is mentioned, if I, whatever film I do or if I give an interview, it always says Oscar-winning director Kevin MacDonald or Kevin MacDonald, Oscar winner. And forever afterwards, you're, no, you're known as this thing. It's like your middle name. And that's a very strange experience. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, but it's helpful in Hollywood. And I, it must be helpful for them because any time I make a, any time I make a, any other film, it always says, from Oscar winner Kevin McDonald. Even though that was in documentary and 15 years ago, they still put it on the poster of the latest film you do that's, you know. So but is it. it possible for an Oscar winning director to ever have, for example, problems with a budget mm. for a project? Of course. Really? Of course. It's no guarantee then. No, 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 no. But, it, it, but it, it, I think it's like anything, it helps. But the further away in time you are from it, the less, the less easy it is. I think, um, uh, you know, I have problems with budgets like everybody else. Okay. And um, you're only as good as your last film, as they say. <laughs> so if your last film may, may lost a lot of money, then it's, uh, it's, it's, it's harder. One would think that after the, the good reception and, and the awards to one, a mm. day in September, you would have gone uh, through this political phase and mm. decide to make just political documentaries mm. or denounce. Mm. Uh, why didn't you choose that? Why didn't you continue Well, you know, One Day in that? September is, is a, is a, was a controversial film for another reason, outside of the documentary world, but because it was about um, a very key moment in the Arab-Israeli question. Mm -hmm. And I found myself being attacked viciously in the press in Israel and in Germany and in Britain and in America by both people on the side of the Palestinians and people on the side of the is Israelis and uh, receiving horrible phone calls, threatening phone calls, this kind of thing. And it's, it's a really oppressive feeling that it's a horrible feeling to be um, hated. <laughs> and uh, so I decided I wanted to do something frivolous. Okay. So uh, the most frivolous thing that occurred was that I was, I was phoned up by Mick Jagger, and I knew, who I knew from a... What could be more frivolous than that? That's very frivolous. <laughs> that is the definition of frivolity. Uh, I had met him making a documentary a few years before. I'd interviewed him. I made a documentary about a man called Donald Camel, who was a painter and a film director and a writer who made only three films, the most interesting and famous of which is called Performance, which yes. is a film that has Mick Jagger in it, right. and Mick Jagger did some of the music. And uh, I had met him, and I got on with him, and so he phoned me up and said, I want to make you a documentary. You got his first personal phone call? Yeah. So I got a phone call saying, are you interested in making a documentary about me? Huh. <laughs> That's what, what I was saying about uh, uh, narcissism earlier. Uh, <laughs> so... I thought, that sounds like fun. And so I started with a, just a little you know, DV camera following him around, and I spent about five months with him and had the time of my life touring the world. This was for TV, right? For TV, yeah. Right. Touring the world and um, flying in his private jet. and Meeting Elton John. And meeting all sorts of people, every rock star you can imagine. So it was an amazing, you know, if you love music, this is a great thing, S being in the studio with him. You know, I think I think um, you know it was it was it was a, a, an amazing thing to do, but the film unfortunately he didn't like, and uh, because he had asked me to do it and it was being financed through him through his company, they took it away from me and re-edited re it to, to be more what they wanted it to be, and so the film that c it came out is not very good. Unfortunately, I had the original cut, but I took it to a festival in Sweden a few years ago and they lost it. Oh. So I don't have it anymore. That and sounds like a conspiracy theory. <laughs> conspiracy. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, agent from so very annoyingly, yeah, I never, I never got it back. But um, what uh, were the big differences between your version? Well, and his? it's the usual, the usual thing, you know. That um, I look so old in that shot. <laughs> I look depressed. Can't you have me being happier? Um, I, you know, I, I don't want that bit where I'm arguing with someone. I see. So it becomes a very bland, uninteresting kind of film. 
It had some nice scenes in it still, but uh, it becomes very bland. And but he's, I, a, he's a rock star from the 60s, right? So well, he's that's approached why he survived, I'm sure, because he's, I mean, he's a, he, the interesting thing is that before I made the film, I, f I knew somebody very, very slightly, a documentary maker who had made another film with the Rolling Stones a couple of years before, which had never been completed. And I phoned her up and I said, what happened? You know, and she said, well, you know, I'm the latest in a line of people who have made films for Mick Jagger and the Stones, and, and they didn't like what I did, and that was it. I never heard from them again. And they, never, they, they spent a million dollars on the film, and they never released it. And so um, I thought, well, I probably shouldn't do this film. But on the other hand, Mick Jagger has phoned you up. Sounds like fun. Maybe it'll be different this time. But of course, it never is different. You delude, you delude yourself into thinking that it's going to be different. And so I, um, I, I don't regret the experience because it's a, I've got you know, some of my best stories <laughs> I'm sure. Some of my best dinner party anecdotes are about uh, the time I spent with Mick. I'm sure. Um, I spent 9-11 with Mick. I watched the Twin Towers come down with Mick Jagger in his dressing gown. That's a memory I'll always What have. was his face? <laughs> What was his face? He was, yeah. Uh, you yeah. were watching on, eating on TV, yes, right? Yes, he was, he, was, um, he was very shocked. Then, of course, he decided, well, we have to put 9-11 into the documentary. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> What has 9-11 got to do with the Rolling Stones? It's funny because it's so... That kind, of, that kind of thing, you know, the craziness of It was Rockstar. like this reality TV celebrity show before it became a... What do you mean, sorry? Uh, this, all these shows about celebrities being yes. filmed all the time? Yes. Uh, it, was a, it was sort that was of... Like uh, the idea, yes. right? No, well, the idea of the film was to show what life is like to be Mick Jagger, one of the most famous people in the world. And so that's But a very frivolous idea, and I guess that's similar to a reality TV sort of show. Um, but it was much more intimate. I mean, what was interesting about him was that I was literally everywhere with him for months. I was staying in his house. I'd go to parties with him. I'd go to weddings with him. I'd go... That was a sort of a... Really, I did feel like I was living his life. <laughs> and um, uh, so that was interesting, but, the, but, the, the, but the, 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 the struggle I had, even in my version of the film, was to make that very interesting because there's nothing at stake. And I think one of the things I've seen, if you're interested in the Rolling Stones, if you've watched a lot of the documentaries about the Rolling Stones, is that there's no substance. And I think this, the, the, the Rolling Stones don't really have much substance as artists. It's all about attitude. Uh -huh. Rock and roll attitude. Uh -huh. And um, so, in a way, the struggle of making a film about them is to see what, apart from the superficial, the lifestyle, the parties, the wealth, what is there to say? And that's a very interesting struggle. The, the, the best film about the Rolling Stones is called Cocksucker Blues, which I'm sure... Which Mick Dagger doesn't like which, either. Which Mick Dagger doesn't like, and that's why it's the best film. Um, uh, it was made by Robert Frank, the famous uh -huh. photographer and it's banned around the world. Otherwise, I'm sure Javier would be showing it here. You can get it, pirated copies. And um, the, the, what the film, the secret in the film, the reason they don't like it, I, I believe, but this is my theory, the reason they don't like it is because it shows the vacuousness, the emptiness at the heart of the Rolling Stones. And... Uh, I think it's not about, because people say oh, it's banned because of the drug taking and the Which groupies and the girls. And it's not that. I think it's because there's a famous shot in it where Mick Jagger and Keith Richards are, sh are talking about, I think, about where they're going to go for lunch. And it goes on and on and on. And the camera then, there's a cat that comes behind them and walks behind them. And the, 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 the camera just follows the cat. <laughs> And because the cat, and they're going, nee, 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 and because the cat is more interesting than they are. <laughs> and that is what sums up, I think, the Rolling Stones in a way. But having, you know, I'm not, I like Mick Jagger a lot, and he's actually a very nice man. And he was very generous to me and very nice to me. But um, uh, there was no fight, there was no. Oh, we had a huge fight. No, but was, yeah. it, was there really? I shouted at Mick Jagger, <laughs> um, and his producer said to me, and Mick Jagger stormed out of the room, and his producer said to me, in the 20 years I've been working with Mick Jagger, I've never heard anyone talk to him like that. How dare you? 
And that's part of the problem that nobody tells these people the truth. Nobody right. tells them. Nobody tells them the truth. So they they right. yeah. dictators. They're little mini dictators. Yeah. Yes. Uh, anyway, I guess the biggest difference between that uh, that film and the others you've made is that that one, uh, Big Meek, was an assignment. Mm. It was not born from your yes um, from your in interest. So what did you learn? Uh, for well, your I career? learned. I learned very simply. Um, I learned that you can have fun making a film, but it doesn't necessarily mean the film's going to be any good. But also, I learned not to do that again. I was then ab asked to do a film with Paul McCartney, I was asked to do a film with The, S the Who, and I didn't want to do those because I knew it would be the same thing, and it's boring. Uh -huh. um, and you're just a slave to their images and you're not going to be able to do anything you're new. You're like an employee for them in a way. You're an employee, exactly. And right. I think I did that once. I found it an interesting experience, but I didn't want to do it again. And so when I came to do this film about Marley, the, the most important thing for me was that I retained control uh -huh. of the film. And luckily, because of the position that the Marley family were in and the music company and everything were in, they allowed me to do that. Um, and so I retained, I retained uh, editorial control of the film. You know, I showed, I showed the people who, the people who control the estate, the, the son of Bob Marley, and the, I had to show them the film. And they would say, well, you know, that's as good, and that's not so good. But they never tried to make me say, you know, you have to cut this out, or this is. Um, and I think part of the reason for that was that for them, it was as much an exploration as it was for me. They want. The, the, the people who control Marley's estate are his children, mostly. And the children never really knew Bob. There's 11 children, and they never really knew him. So I think making the film was, in part, for them, a way of finding out about their father. And it was a very emotional experience for them. So even the negative things in the film, most of the negative things in the film about Marley come from them, come from within the family, talking yes. about him. Um, and it's I hopefully a very honest a very honest film which isn't in thrall to his image. In fact, the very idea of the film is to, is to go behind the image. They, you know, here's one of the most iconic images and faces in the world, probably as iconic as Che Guevara. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, just this weekend, I had two encounters with the Marley image. I, I went to the beach and someone gave me a Bob Marley towel. <laughs> and then I went to lunch and there was a three-year-old boy wearing a Bob Marley T-shirt, <laughs> and I thought, "This, this is in Valparaiso." Yes. <laughs> I thought well, that's it's a little, everywhere. that's a little, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and so to go, but the aim of the film was to say, who is the human being of Bob Marley? How did he get to be the image that he is? The same with the widow, with Rita. Since, uh, yes, I think she, she d doesn't usually talk. Yes, she she was she was absolutely absolutely no problem to me. Okay. But. Uh, I'm not sure if she was completely honest with me, um, but you're never quite sure. Obviously, part of doing a documentary where you're interviewing people is that the audience have to make up their own minds. Do you trust this person? Are they telling me the truth? And that's part of what's interesting. In a complicated documentary is the interplay between the audience and the interviewees. If you didn't have interviewees, you could just have you know, a voiceover and a footage, concert footage and just tell a story. But that's not what's interesting. What's interesting is seeing people and seeing their characters emerge and they are talking, it's giving their memories. And memory is never objective. It's always subjective. Mm -hmm. And, and they, sometimes you'll never know. And sometimes you'll never know. And that's what's interesting about it um, to me. That's what I love about doing interview-based documentaries. I asked about Rita because uh, widows sometimes are a big thing when mm. writing biographies or mm. making documentaries. Did you see the Harrison movie, for example? Yes. Well, I thought that was, that was a, a, a very interesting film, but it was compromised Absolutely. a great deal by the, the widow's involvement, and she paid for it as well. Um, in this case, with the Marley film, luckily, they had nothing to do with the... They were paid. The Marley family were paid for the music, but they had nothing to do with... Uh, with um, uh, you know, financing the film. Right. The film was financed, you know, in the best the best kind of way, which is a very rich man. Oh, really? Who's a big fan of Bob Marley, a billionaire. <laughs> you cannot tell his name. Yes, yes. His name is Steve Bing. He's one of the producers on the film. He's a he's a um, American heir to a huge real estate fortune. 
and he loves Bob Marley. Wow. And uh, so I had tried to make a film about Marley seven or eight years ago. I couldn't get the rights. It was and very he approached you? He then, I got to know Chris Blackwell, who's yes. the, uh, who is the kind of, uh, the, who is the producer of Marley, uh, the, the, the record company boss of Marley. And he was trying to help me make my film, but it never happened. We couldn't get it to work. And then he s mentioned my name to this billionaire and said, with the billionaire, we wanted to make a film about Marley. And Chris Blackwell said, oh, you should talk to Kevin. He was trying to make a film. So that was how we got put together. And he, f so he financed everything. And the interesting thing was that the film will never make money because it costs so much to make. Okay. Because... Uh, I the, understand the, the music rights were huge. The music rights are huge. The archive costs are huge. Blah, blah, blah. Lots of things. So it's a film made with love. It's a film made, uh, you know, in the best possible way, which is not for money. The man, he, he wanted to make as much of his money back as he could. I don't think he's lost so much, but he certainly hasn't made any money. But he's very proud of the film, and it's what he's, he had wanted to do for a long, for a long time. Uh, you were comparing Marley with Che Guevara. Uh, I guess the biggest difference is that Guevara is a controversial figure, not yes. Marley. It's yes. hard maybe to find somebody who will talk but Marley, but Marley, uh, but, but, bad but things about Guevara. But Guevara, I Marley. think what's interesting is that Guevara is controversial only to people who really know about him. Uh -huh. He's not, if you went to a European university and you asked about Guevara, they would, people would say, oh, oh you know, he's a revolutionary and he looked cool. That's all they know. Mm -hmm. I know here in, in Latin America that people know more. But uh, I think Marley is also a controversial figure, if you know enough. But he's a, he, 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 was, he had a radical message of liberation and a radical message of um, religion. And I think that's the reason that he did not succeed in becoming a huge star in America until after he died, because people were threatened by him. Um, he was even African-Americans who he wanted to reach with his message of return to Africa, of pride in Africa, they weren't ready to listen to that, that message. They, they um, were still and still are now, I think, saw themselves as Americans more than Africans. Mm -hmm. I thought it was booming how his lovers uh, remembered him, no resentment at all? Yes, I think, I think, well, I think it's interesting what you were saying about, you know, people, negativity about Marley. It is difficult to find people to be negative. The most negative people about him are his family because his children feel like he abandoned them, his wives, maybe right. his wife and his girlfriends maybe feel like he was dishonorable or disloyal. But outside of that, I interviewed 90 people. He was a man who people loved in a really deep way, even if they felt like some musicians felt like he had uh, ripped them off in the end or they felt that uh, they didn't get their fair Not share of whatever, enough. yeah. yeah. Um, they didn't hold resentment about him in the same way as all the women in his life. I interviewed a lot of these girlfriends who were all, you know, he was with a wife while he was with two other girls. Right. And he was, but he did it in such a way that people didn't hate him for it. I think it's It was amazing. just who, who, he, who he was. And I think that, that is, uh, I came away, I, I started making the film about Marley with a cynicism, feeling that he was, uh, he, had he was a, um, uh, a commodified product now, that he is used to sell things, that he's on towels and t-shirts, and means little more than that. And I ended the film feeling huge love for him and feeling respect for him, which doesn't happen very often, I can tell you, when you make a film about somebody, that you usually start off fascinated and in love with them and wanting to know more, and the end, you feel, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that I know about that person. I'm not sure I like them so much. <laughs> um, but with Marley, it was the opposite journey mm -hmm. for me. You've said it's one of your most, or maybe your most conventional documentary. Yes. Um, testimonies play a big part on, on it. Mm. Uh, it's not like you feel that all documentaries have to be based on testimonies, but no, in a way, it's a, it's this a conventional was the way to approach yes. this, right? Well, I think that the... the the reason a good documentary, I don't think, had been made about Marley before is partly because of uh, the problems of dealing with the Marley estate and the music companies, and it, partly to do with that, but also to do with the fact that they're, unlike, unlike the big European and American rock acts, the other kind of icons of rock and roll, there wasn't really very much 
first of all, there's only probably two or three interviews that Bob ever gave. Yeah, yeah. And in those interviews, he's very combative and difficult and not really giving very much. And secondly, there's the first 12 years of his career, there's not a single piece of moving footage. There's only a few photographs. So Just because you of can't, poverty, right? Because of we poverty. He's from, a, he's from a really poor country, a developing world country. And, uh, and not only that, but he's from the lowest of the low. He's, he's a poor... You can see where he was born. He's a poor country boy who grew up in a little shack, sleeping on the gr bare earth, and who then moved to the city and lived in the slum in the poorest part of the city. And he became a Rasta. And Rastas in Jamaica were the lowest of the low of the low. There are stories of Bob going to people's houses when he was starting to get a little known. He would go to somebody's house in the uptown areas in Kingston, and the servants would refuse to serve him. They would refuse to give him a drink or give him lunch because he was a Rasta. So you can imagine that's how... So there's no real record, there's no photographs, there's nothing written down, he never wrote anything down. So that is, makes it very hard to make a, a film in the normal way. And, but of course, to me, that made it very intriguing. How do you make a film about somebody who, for whom there's no record left behind, other than the music, and a few con concerts, two or three concerts recorded? So first of all, you have to research a lot to find little bits of photos here and a, a little bit of home movie film here and try and put those things together. But really, the answer I came up with was is that this is, a, this is an oral history. Mm -hmm. okay. It's about people talking, and in the way that they talk, lots of people, 60, 70 interviewees, their words and their, the emotion that they um, exude about Marley, it's those words and those emotions that create the image of, of Bob. So it's a very verbal film. And it's interesting that those testimonies come from everywhere. You probably went to more yes. than 15 countries. Yeah, we went all over, all over. And, and uh, um, it seemed important to me that the film be very long. Right. I didn't want to, it's, it is a very long film. It's two and a half hours long. Originally it was three hours long, but I had to take it down a bit. But because I had a, you know, that makes it very hard to sell. And so, but luckily, because I had this billionaire, <laughs> he wasn't so worried. He wanted the best film that it could be. And we decided that the film was best at two and a half hours long. And part of the reason for that was because it's the, the cumu accumulation of detail that makes it interesting. Once you start making a film in the normal length, say an hour or 90 minutes, you have to tell a story that's so simplified. You know, documentaries are not great at, at giving detail. I often think that when you make a documentary, you can, you can put all the information that's in a one-hour documentary into one newspaper article. So it's not great for, you know, not great for information. It's good for emotion, uh -huh. and it's good for character. So in order to really get the information out and get the characters out, I felt I needed a long period of time. And also because when you make a conventional length documentary of 90 minutes or an hour, you have to stick usually to a three-act structure. Which are, like which a dramatic structure, which is you know, a beginning, middle, and end. Okay. Um, and at the end of the first act, you have to have a, you know, a twist. And then, you know, that's the sort of structure that most biographies have to fall into if they're in that time length. But if you expand the length of time, you can, have, you can reflect the complexity of somebody's life more. You don't have to squeeze it into a format which is, um, which is just convenient. To the, to the film. So, in one way, the film is very conventional, Marley, but in another way, it's, 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 it's formally uh, unconventional because it takes these very conventional um, use of testimony, and of chronology. archive, and chronology, um, but merely by the fact of its length and the quantity of testimony, it becomes something a little bit different. You're here in a f music documentary festival. Mm. Do you enjoy watching? Music documentaries at all? Ah, uh, yeah, I, I love music, and music plays a big part in my life and in all my films, even the ones that aren't about about musicians. Uh -huh. I, I, uh, one of the things I do when I'm making any film is, while I'm writing the script or thinking of the idea for the documentary, if it's a documentary, I will find a soundtrack to listen to 
and I give it, and when I'm making a fiction film, I give that to the actors, and I say, to get here's, inspired by it yes, somehow? Here's, the, here's the world in, in sound. This is the kind of music I'm thinking. And I think it's a, it's a great way of communicating something that's not just verbal about your intentions of a, of a film. Um, in fact, one of my favorite, maybe my top three favorite documentaries of all time, one of them is one that you're showing here, which is Gimme Shelter, mm -hmm. which to me is the best ever music documentary and is, is one of the great documentaries. It shows what documentary can do. Um, with your friend Mick Jagger in it. With my friend Mick Jagger in it. Um, I think, fun, I, I was very thrilled just about a month or two ago, I was in New York and I met Albert Maisels, who made that film. Yes. So, and that was a great, he's very, very old now. He's like 92 or something, 91. Um, still making films, still shooting. And uh, I think he's one of the great, great documentary makers. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Life in a Day. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I know that uh, before, before uh, talking about the whole project, which is unique, nothing like that has ever been done before or afterwards, uh, you said that it was very much influenced by um, the mass observation project yes. that was run in Britain during the 40s, 50s. Yes. I was reading about it yesterday. Yes. It's very interesting. I would like you to explain a little what, what the mass observation yeah. project was. Well, one of, the, one of my great heroes in documentary and who made one of my other top three documentaries is a British filmmaker who you should show a film of his here next year. Um, he's called Humphrey Jennings. And he's not well known outside of Britain, really. Um, but he was, he was known as the poet of British cinema. And he only really made films for about a 12-year period. He died very young in 1950. He had a terrible accident, in fact. It's the, every, every director's nightmare. He was scouting for a location for a film. And he had the viewfinder up to his eye. And he went, no, I need to be a little wider, a little wider, a little wider. And he stepped off a cliff. Oh, really? And he died. Oh. <laughs> yeah, pretty terrible. <laughs> uh, um, so he should have had a wider lens. <laughs> um, uh, That's black humor. Sorry, bad, bad taste humor. Black humor. Um, so so um, he made, he, he was, he, before he became a filmmaker, he was a surrealist poet and a surrealist painter. He organized the first surrealist exhibition in England in 1936. And he started an organization along with an anthropologist and a sociologist. Um, it was a, a, a movement called Mass Observation. And the idea was, why do we only do anthropology of, at that time, in the 30s, only do anthropology of exotic foreign cultures? Why don't we do anthropology of our own society? And also, why in our own society do we only hear from the great and the good and the elite what do people who are just ordinary people, what do they think about things? And what do they, how do they experience their lives? What's important to them, what's not important to them? And so they started this project, which was to record ordinary life for a mass of people. And so they asked for volunteers, and they, maybe 500 people, and they said to them all, okay, every Wednesday, I want you to record in a diary what you do, and the detail of what you do. So I got up at 8.30, I had eggs and bacon just for breakfast. Just writing it down, right? And just write it down. And then they also would ask them questions. Once a month, they would send them questions and say, what do you have on your mantelpiece? Uh, what were the names of the dogs that you met this week? What graffiti did you see today? Mm -hmm. And people were just these very mundane things. They would write them down. And it became this uh, partly anthropological process, but also partly about uh, surrealism, about joining together of s two very distinct ideas. And, uh, and, and appreciating the strangeness of ordinary life. And so... And the diversity. And probably. the diversity uh -huh. of ordinary life. And out of this, they created certain books and magazines. And, and in fact, the, the, the movement went on into the 1950s and 60s even. In fact, it still happens now in a, in a, in a small way. And uh, I was fascinated with this, but this, this man went on then to use these ideas in films uh, during the war, propaganda films really for Brit the British government. And he made a beautiful film, which you should show it in edit next year, 
called Listen to Britain. It's only 20 minutes long. It's about music and sound of Britain at war in 1943, 42, 43. And it's a kind of collage of people around Britain. No narrative, just poetic links between different places and different people. And uh, I always loved this film, and in fact, I made a documentary about Humphrey Jennings, this man. And so I was then approached a couple of years ago by YouTube, who said, we want to make a film, but we don't know what it should be. Would you, do you have an idea? Do you want to make a film for us? And using YouTube, that was the only thing. So I said, well, we should do mass observation film. We should do the same thing that these people did with writing diaries, we should do that on film. So we went out and using the might of YouTube and using, a, my producer on the film was Ridley Scott, obviously a very famous name, and using his fame and the power of YouTube, we broadcast around the world saying, anyone who wants to take part in this experiment on a certain day, the 24th of July, 2010, get a camera, film your life, film the ordinary things that happen in your life. That's great to know, because I thought that it was your idea. It was your idea. No, it was my idea. They, they came and they said, let's make a film. What, what, what can we do? And uh, so we, Entonces, we um, uh, had from this, we, had, and we also stole the idea from, from mass observation of asking questions. So we asked people three questions. What, what do you love? What do you hate? What makes you encanta, happy? Te carga, and te hace feliz. Um, or what's in your pocket? Sorry. Oh, ¿qué está en tu bolsillo? ¿Qué tienes en el bolsillo? Classic, Porque classic una de las típicas preguntas que se hace a través del movimiento de la observación masiva es qué so thought, eh, well, tienes en tu eh, cabina. No sé cuál es la traducción exacta, um, <laughs> pero tiene que ser algo. Mantele. Uh, Mantele. Uh, Today I thought, well, what do you have in your pocket? That y might bueno, say dijimos, ¿qué puedes, eh, qué tienes so en los bolsillos? We these Entonces, we had 80, hicimos estas preguntas, tuvimos 80.000 eh, personas which, que quisieron participar de 180 países. Y, y pensé que eran todos los países en el mundo. Y según la definición, me parece que las Naciones Unidas so eh, tienen 197. Así que teníamos prácticamente todos los países del mundo diciendo algo, aportando algo. Hubo 4.500 Beautifully shot, horas you know. de filmación en el teléfono people, y tuvimos un equipo de 20 personas y vieron este material said, okay, lo empezaron y dijeron bueno tenemos Islands, esto de las this, islas sunset, tanto tiene dancing, una puesta de sol got, tiene bailes y colocaban estas palabras claves dentro de una base de datos utilizábamos esta base de datos para poder averiguar qué teníamos, porque no era posible que una sola persona viera en 4.500 horas. Y teníamos un sistema de investigación, cinco estrellas, pensábamos que era maravilloso, cuatro estrellas, es bueno, debería estar en la película, tres estrellas, hay algo interesante, dos estrellas, una estrella. Una estrella, la definición de nosotros era que la persona que filmó esto le puso menos esfuerzo que nosotros en filmarlo de lo que nosotros le hemos puesto a mirarlo. Entonces, observé cuatro, cinco, tres estrellas. Ese fue el material que yo estuve viendo por seis semanas. ¿Cuánto tiempo? Seis semanas. Y había algo maravilloso, uno veía el mundo pasar ante tus ojos. Inside people's intimate y uno veía la vida íntima de las personas de una forma uh, extraordinaria. Era como leer diarios de vida, diarios de vida um, íntimos de las personas. Y a partir de esto so comenzamos a tener una temática, la desigualdad, uh, food, la alimentación, uh, love for children, el amor fear por death, los hijos, el temor um, por la muerte. Uh, la enfermedad, la, la familia, distintas temáticas surgieron que realmente eh, son las preocupaciones en esencia de la raza humana y eso es lo que surgió a partir de esto, fue lo interesante, es que somos todos distintos, tenemos distintas ideas políticas, intelectuales, pero finalmente estamos preocupados de las mismas ideas y sentimientos. Entonces, esas emociones básicas y sentimientos se tornaron en la estructura de la película. Y estructuramos esta película como una pieza musical, una sinfonía. Fue, fueron 90 minutos de duración. Existe mucha música, no existe una narrativa tradicional, pero existe una narrativa emocional, diría yo. 
you, you watch the film in a way that's very different than watching a normal film. It's a very different film. It's a very different film. It's a very different film. a very different film. It's 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 a very different film. Hay una que se ha hecho en Japón, que se llama Japón en un día, que es acerca del tsunami, el terremoto, hay otro en Jamaica, Italia, Gran Bretaña, por la BBC, Gran Bretaña en un día, y yo estoy viendo la posibilidad de hacer una de la Navidad en el Reino Unido. ¿Qué hace la gente? ¿Qué piensan ellos durante el día? Así que continuamos con este proyecto de la observación masiva en el mundo moderno. Ciertamente es un desafío bastante único, pero dirías que lo que hiciste en esa película es más bien la labor de un editor que de director. Yes, it is definitely an editorial job. But I think that most of making any editorial is an editorial job. Yes, but well, in the majority of documentaries, one has to do the work of an editor. Hay algo bien interesante y me gustaría ver las 4.500 horas a distintos directores y ver las distintas películas que surgirían a partir de eso, porque yo vi los vínculos de temáticas y de ideas y yo respondí ante distintas cosas en las imágenes que observé, pero eso refleja mi propio carácter y mis preocupaciones y siempre va a ser subjetivo, así que la película que yo creé es mi impresión de lo que esas 4.500 horas conforman y un director distinto que haría algo totalmente distinto en base a ese material. Lo clave en este proyecto es confiar en que la gente, la gente normal y común y corriente pueden ser documentaristas, pueden ser artistas, por supuesto. Me parece que sí. Muchos directores de cine estuvieron desafiados por esta noción de dar el control a las personas, a la gente. De hecho, tú adquiriste tus propias cámaras. Bueno, parte de países en desarrollo. Obviamente queríamos tener la representación en distintos países. Algunas personas no las tenían y enviamos estas cámaras a India, al sudeste asiático. Así que a través de distintas organizaciones enviamos 500 cámaras, me parece que fueron, pero esta gente entonces no estaba muy familiarizada con el concepto de documentales. Eso resultó en algo bien interesante, pero a su vez, en el darse cuenta de que es algo occidental, de tendencia occidental, en esta tendencia, el creer que tu vida es bastante interesante o lo suficientemente interesante para compartirla. Cuando uno es una pequeña villa en el norte de India, probablemente solo vea la televisión, ve películas de Hollywood y ve televisión que son noticias estatales o de control estatal. Y lo que a uno le pregunta y que siempre se ha visto como ignorado y poco importante, importante el preguntarle a alguien, muéstrame tu vida, ¿qué Pero crees que es interesante? Es, es bastante alienado, es interesante a su vez, íbamos a distintos villorios en India y uno tenía distintos materiales en el cual hay alguien parado, bastante rígido y les preguntaban, ¿qué te encanta? Me encanta mi familia. Y detrás de ellos uno veía las cosas más sorprendentes llevándose a cabo. Hermosos mercados y bailes, pero nunca se lo mostraban porque para ellos eso no era interesante, era la vida común y corriente. Fue un experimento fascinante y la película la, la veo como una experimental. Y he sido sorprendido por cuántas personas la han visto en YouTube, a pesar de que es una película película sin narrativa y experimental. De cierta forma es una película que es una metáfora de cómo experimentamos el mundo a través de Internet. El hecho de que podemos estar en cualquier lugar del mundo a través de Internet. Al mismo tiempo, y 
nuestra experiencia del mundo no es geográfica ni física, es electrónica y de cierta forma es una película que refleja eso que es una metáfora para ellos, esa forma de experimentar el mundo. Cuando comenzaste a hacer películas, nadie tenía la noción que 10 eh, años después el, el poder filmar o las cámaras digitales harían que esto fuera tan fácil. Eso es lo interesante de Life in a Day, la vida en un día. Antes de esta era no habría sido posible hacerlo porque las cámaras son baratas y tan disponibles. YouTube tiene seis años de antigüedad y con YouTube y la gente descargando, enviándose cosas entre sí y nosotros comunicándonos con las personas. Eso sería más bien imposible, así que es el producto de la tecnología. Ahora todos pueden ser documentaristas. ¿Cómo sientes esta responsabilidad de ser uno más profesional? Bueno, básicamente supongo que me alejé de la vida en un día sintiendo que a su vez tengo algunas habilidades valiosas. El ser un documentarista es una profesión muerta, porque todos pueden ser un, un director de cine, o documentarista, o periodista. Y de la misma forma que yo puedo defender el periodismo tradicional y decir, por eso es acerca de, eh, de este tópico en particular. El periodismo es algo, tener a los blogueros, tenemos que tener a personas capacitadas, personas que estudian. Al mismo tiempo es necesario tener a cineastas, que son el filtro que le proporcionan estructura al caos de la realidad. En el mundo, si uno va a YouTube, existen cientos de miles, millones de videos. La mayoría no son interesantes. Algunos son fantásticos, pero la mayoría no lo son. Y los que son buenos son creados por personas que son profesionales o semiprofesionales. De los cineastas. Así que esto de la vida en un día era dar una suerte de orden, una estructura a esas cientos de horas de filmación. Así que al final me sentí un poco más optimista acerca del futuro de los documentaristas y la industria relacionada. ¿Ha sido tu tarea más obsesiva, me imagino, a alguien soñando el proyecto? Para mí fue la experiencia más estimulante a nivel técnico de todo lo que he hecho, ya que es algo tan novedoso y no hay ninguna película que se le parezca, así que uno se encuentra caminando por la oscuridad intentando dilucidar qué se puede hacer con este material, cómo tiene que ser representado. Y me parece que existe algo bastante emocionante de ser el primero en realizar algo. Estoy involucrado, como te dije, en uno de la Navidad. Y aparte de eso, acabo de crear una película de ciencia ficción que estoy editando, que no es convencional, bueno, no tanto quizás, es de una historia de amor adolescente. Y lo siguiente que voy a hacer es otra película de ficción. Así que quiero equilibrar estos dos y continuar con el documento y la ficción. Probablemente seas más conocido por tu trabajo en Chile por El Último Rey de Escocia. Y quizás sea una de tus películas con mejores críticas, muchas buenas críticas, muchos premios. ¿Qué has aprendido acerca de tener una película tan exitosa? Especialmente después de haber hecho la sombra del poder. Primero hice El último rey de Escocia y después La sombra del poder. Leí que tú nunca leí las críticas, primero que todo. Nunca leo las críticas. Porque cuando hice esta película de un día en septiembre y tuve distintas respuestas de las personas, la verdad es que sentí no tener que saber cómo leía la película. Hasta un cierto nivel, si uno lee buenas críticas, uno siente que es maravilloso, que uno es excelente, que no necesariamente es bueno. Y si uno lee malas críticas, uno se siente deprimido acerca de su trabajo y hace que uno quiera detenerse en ese punto. Y yo sé qué es bueno y malo de una película y sé qué ver lo que todos los demás piensan, porque la verdad es que no me hace un bien psicológico, ya sea una buena o mala respuesta. Me parece que lo ignoro y sigo adelante colocando mi energía en lo siguiente.
And I've had films that have been well reviewed and not so well reviewed. Que han tenido buena crítica, otras um, que no tanto. I also think that sometimes y pienso también que a veces las películas que uno piensa que son las mejores películas no son las mejores películas para los críticos. Y tal vez en etapas posteriores la gente vuelva y dice, ah, tal vez era una película muy interesante. Y lo mismo con cosas que han tenido buenas críticas más adelante. Uno mira atrás y dice, mmm, no era tan bueno. Estoy seguro que todos hemos tenido la experiencia de ver una película 10 años atrás y pensar que es una gran película y después verla de nuevo. Y tía y no, no es tan buena. Lo opuesto también sucede, que uno ve una película en ese momento y dice, ah, no es tan interesante, esto es fome. Y después lo ve 10 años después y dice, ah, esto es realmente interesante. Así que creo que esa es la respuesta. I think we could open the floor to questions, Anne. Quiero recibir preguntas de la audiencia. Adelante, Daniel. Aló, aló. Haz tu pregunta. Perfecto. Sí. Tú que trabajas eh, ficción y documental, ¿cuál es la importancia que le das al guión en el documental? Ya que hay algunos directores que no de documental que prefieren no trabajar con el guión. About the script. Eh, yeah. What importance right. do you give to the script? Yeah. You say, es, algunos documentalistas prefieren no tener guión, quieres decir? Yes. Some documentaries even prefer not to have. Yeah, I know. I, when I was speaking about the script, I was talking about fiction films. Hablando de películas de ficción, pero cuando hago un documental no tengo guión para nada, no, no lo escribo, porque uno limita hacia dónde va la historia. Y yo salgo, voy a grabar y dejo que la historia se desarrolle por sí misma, tomo el material, después lo veo en edición. Normalmente lo que uno pensó al inicio del documental, por ejemplo, ah, estoy haciendo una película de esto, a la vez que uno lo grabó todo y ve todo el material, ah, no, no hice una película de esta forma, hice una película de otra forma. Así que pienso que si hay un guión, uno está limitando lo que va a tomar de lo que grabó. Esa es mi experiencia. Para continuar con la, peli, por la pregunta que se hizo recién, quedé atrapado, quedé atascado con la imagen de ti con Mick Jagger viendo el 11 de septiembre y él diciéndole que hagas algo con eso y tú le dices no no lo voy a hacer estoy concentrándome en otra cosa me imaginé a mí mismo en esa situación y qué, qué haría con eso creo que la mayoría parte de la gente haría algo con eso pero tú tuviste la capacidad de de concentrarte en lo que estabas haciendo. ¿Qué? ¿Cómo lo haces? Tienes que tener algún tipo de forma abierta o mente abierta a ver el mundo para interesarse en varias cosas y a la vez hay que estar muy concentrado. ¿Hay alguna forma que, que hay de concentrarse? ¿Hay momentos precisos así que puede dar de ejemplo? Bueno, ese ejemplo me imagino que era un ejemplo frívolo porque la razón... You know, there probably is something very interesting. Bueno, probablemente hay algo muy interesante en ver la reacción de alguien como Mick Jagger al 11 de septiembre, a los ataques del 11 de septiembre. Pero la razón que él quería que se incluyera es porque él sentía que lo iba a hacer a él y a la película más relevante. Y para mí eso me parecía un, una idea realmente muy narcisista y de alguna forma él es un músico de rock y que debería estar vinculado a este evento trágico e histórico. No tenía nada que ver con él, realmente no le afectaba a él personalmente. Así que me imagino que estaba siendo fiel a la naturaleza frívola de él y la naturaleza frívola del proyecto. No quería vincularlo a él con este gran evento histórico. 
Creo que uno de los puntos que tengo como personalidad es que yo, una vez que tengo la idea de lo que quiero hacer, nada me desvía del camino. Creo que la mayoría de los directores son así y hay que hacer así. A veces uno está equivocado. Así. A veces uno tiene una vida y dice, esto es lo que voy a hacer. Y después se da cuenta que cuando terminó la película, realmente debería haber doblado la derecha, para así decirlo pero no lo hizo. Así que no estoy seguro si es algo positivo eh, tener una mentalidad fija. Tú tienes una idea de lo que quieres, o por lo menos una idea de lo que no quieres. Claro, pero surge mientras se graba el documental. Es distinto un documental compra una película de ficción. En un documental tengo una, un átomo de la idea, pero después cuando hago la película y veo la grabación, veo que la película se puede tratar de otra cosa. Pero creo que con la ficción es distinto. Con la ficción es distinto. Ahí hay micrófono. Gracias. ¿Cómo se le ocurrió la idea de hacer la película Marley? ¿Era usted un gran fanático de Bob Marley? Esa es la primera pregunta. Y segunda pregunta es, ¿cuánto duró la grabación? Bueno, estamos grabando de forma infrecuentemente porque era entrevistas. Estaba haciendo una o dos entrevistas, después paraba un par de semanas y después seguía con una o dos más entrevistas. Creo que la primera entrevista, la primera vez que se grabó, se inició en noviembre, no, octubre de un año, y lo último que grabamos fue un año después. Así que el periodo de grabación era un año. Estaba también grabando otras películas, estaba dirigiendo otras películas como La vida de un día, porque demora mucho en persuadir a la gente que hable. Ahora, no sé si esto lo mencioné anteriormente, pero la idea vino, de, vino en cuanto estaba grabando El último rey de Escocia. El grabar y ver en estas áreas de Uganda, en estas partes pobres de Uganda, había gente que había dibujado graffiti de Bob Marley en, en los muros. Había otras personas que tenían Rasta, y están viviendo allí en Uganda como parte de una religión. No hay otro músico que ha tenido este tipo de impacto que le rezan a él. Treinta años después de que falleció, la gente casi le hace culto a él. Y tiene una significancia e importancia más allá de ser músico. Y eso fue muy interesante para mí. ¿Tú consideras que la película de Marley, los, you consider the movie of Marley la gente que habló fue real al decir las cosas? ¿Están uh, like siendo honestas um, en las entrevistas de Bob Marley? Sí, bueno, varias veces ya he dicho que es para ustedes que lo juzguen. Creo que ustedes se pueden dar cuenta cuando la gente es sincera o cuando están mintiendo, cuando están escondiendo algo. Es por eso que hacemos entrevistas y no solamente usamos una voz en off. Es por eso que vemos a alguien, porque como audiencia están leyendo tanto de ellos, de su lenguaje corporal y lenguaje no verbal, aparte de cómo hablan, aparte de cómo se expresan. Así que para mí eso es lo que es fascinante de las entrevistas, porque la entrevista es como un tipo de sillón de psiquiatra, ¿verdad? La persona no se está comunicando solamente a través de hechos o informaciones, se están comunicando a, a través del de lenguaje no verbal mientras hablan contigo. Obviamente si sentía que la gente me mentía, los desafiaba y trataba de que dijeran la verdad. Ah, pero a veces uno puede hacer eso o a veces no sabe si están diciendo la verdad o no. Mucho de eso está a juicio de audiencia. Una más acá, perdona. Una más pregunta eh, aquí. ¿Te trae esto de hacer cine y tantas películas y documentales eh, al mismo tiempo? Eh, ¿Crees que esto es una cosa familiar? is a cost for your family? Do you think this is a cost or a burden on your family or friends? Or a friendship cost to be working on so many projects simultaneously? 
Bueno, no estoy trabajando en tantos proyectos simultáneamente. En realidad, solamente cuando estaba trabajando en la película Marley, estaba trabajando la vida en un día y ninguna de estas películas eran una película a tiempo completo. De otra forma, estaría corriendo a todos lados. Pero sí, bueno, como cualquiera, si trabaja demasiado, no ve su familia, no, sé, no ve sus amigos, entonces hay que tener cuidado de no trabajar demasiado. Pero no es, es así en la vida en general, es para cualquiera. Hola. Okay. Con respecto a su película El último rey de Escocia, ¿cómo fue el génesis de esta película? ¿Cómo nace la idea de, de llevarla a cabo? ¿Cómo fue la idea de Last King of Scotland? Right. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's based on a novel. Bueno, se basa en una novela. Um, que leí y pensé que era muy interesante. Y después de eso trabajé con un muy buen guionista en crearla. Ahora, lo que me interesó acerca de, esta, de este tema era hacer una película acerca del colonialismo y acerca de la actitud, por ejemplo, una actitud racista postcolonial. El personaje principal es un tipo de estudiante que está viajando alrededor del mundo haciendo deo, que es algo muy común para los alumnos de clase media. Salen un año, seis meses, llegan a un lugar pobre y experimentan la pobreza, experimentan una cultura exótica y sienten como que están aprendiendo el mundo. Pero en cualquier momento simplemente pueden tomar el avión y irse a casa o el papá le manda un cheque o un envío de dinero para que se vayan a casa. Yo estaba interesado en el personaje principal, alguien así que siente que puede ir a otra cultura y es inmune o se siente inmune de estar involucrado en las políticas de ese lugar y que siente que como hombre blanco en África tiene un privilegio o una posición privilegiada, es decir, que es intocable. Y durante el proceso de la película se ve que no es intocable, que se ve atrapado y tiene que aprender esa lección. Ese fue el tema que me interesó en esa pieza. Antes estaba él y después... Yo te quería preguntar porque con un poco de con una duda en Marley que no sé si te quería preguntar si Marley se encontró o no se encontró con Silas Yai en algún momento con Silas sí, Yai porque en un momento la mujer de Marley y todo el mundo en Jamaica todo el mundo se encontró con Silas Yai y Marley siendo que adoraba a Silas Yai y siendo Marley nunca se mostró en la película si se encontró o no se encontró con Silas Yai esa es mi pregunta. Did Marley ever did Marley ever meet uh, meet uh, Hani Saliasi? It's not clear on the film or No, he didn't. No, no, no lo no, um, lo, no se reunió con él. He uh, Mar, um, uh, Selassie died in 1976. Salas, Salas falleció and, en 1976. Uh, Salasi tenía una relación ambigua con los Rasta. Estaba fascinado con ellos, pero también pensó que eran un poco locos. Él fue a visitar, ah, fue a visitar Jamaica y eso se encuentra en la película. Se encuentra la grabación de eso en la película y es una gran experiencia para aquellos que eran Rasta porque ellos sentían que vieron a Cristo de ir a su país porque para ellos Jaime Selassie, Jaime Selassie era Cristo, el Cristo renacido. Por eso eh, el, el ver estas marcas en sus manos cuando levanta las manos era ver a Cristo y muchas de las personas que estaban ahí y que vieron esto tenían visiones muy similares, visiones religiosas que compartían. Por ejemplo, cuando yo lo vi, él me miró directamente al ojo y sentí el amor de Dios y ese tipo de cosas. Es el tipo de hipnosis masivo, me imagino. Adelante primero y luego tú. Pero Marley, Marley conoció a los nietos de Salasi, su nieta específicamente, y le dio un anillo, le dieron un anillo que era de Salasi. Él estaba en Londres en 1977 y era su gran tesoro. Después tú, ella y después tú. Espera. Hi. 
Um, I wrote my undergraduate dissertation You're... on the influence of cinema on literature, and you seem like a director who's interested in a lot of different sort of disciplines, mm. literature, journalism, mm. and you're here talking about music. Mm. Um, do you think this is why you're so successful? Es la razón de por qué es tan exitoso. No estoy seguro si soy tan exitoso, pero realmente estoy interesado en varias cosas y me gusta hacer varias películas de todos mis intereses. Y como había dicho, algunas de ellas son exitosas y otras no. Y para mí esto es una vía artística más interesante que en vez de siempre buscar la perfección en una área. Pero esa es solamente mi opinión. Ahora, creo que la relación entre la literatura y las películas es fascinante, y viceversa también. Muchas veces cuando leo las novelas modernas contemporáneas, uno puede sentir la influencia de las películas en el sentido de que ahora hay... En muchas películas, el escritor se imagina el guión que se va a escribir desde su libro mientras escribe en su libro. Es casi como que la película y es un medio tan poderoso, es casi como que ha tomado control de la literatura como un virus en algunas formas. Pero obviamente al revés. Tenemos películas que se basan en libros. Me parece que son las más comunes, inspiradas por una obra, un libro, o qué sé yo. Pero yo he creado bastantes películas basadas en libros y uno cuando va creando la película intenta alejarse de la influencia del libro, ya que las, en las películas las cosas funcionan de forma bastante distinta. ¿Puedo tener tu opinión acerca de la 3D? No soy un fanático de la cine 3D me parece que puede funcionar muy bien pero para mí es algo que funciona para cierto tipo de películas si uno quiere tener una experiencia inmersa no me parece que una forma natural de ver una película tomo el ejemplo de mis hijos tengo tres hijos pequeños y los llevo a películas 3D Disney qué sé yo e invariablemente miro en la mitad de la película y ellos se, se han quitado los lentes y realmente no les importa si se ve borrosos si los lentes el 3D artificial que vemos en el cine no es como experimentamos el mundo quizás con el tiempo va a haber un tipo de cine 3D que realmente nos contagia a todos pero por el momento me parece que no Hola, me gustaría averiguar ¿Cuál es el, qué criterio mantienes en lo que se refiere a la plástica? De, en la, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo desarrollas el, el film? Porque en general, si nosotros hablamos de cine documental, la plástica eh, es más como un realismo objetivo. Sin embargo, eh, por lo que me, me pareció, no sé si viste el film de Two Gar, eh, Searching for Two Gar Men. Eh, tiene una plástica bastante exquisita y romántica que va mostrando la historia eh, con una manera que genera eh, un poco de subjetividad sobre la historia. Sin embargo, cuando hablamos de documentales, eh, uno se encuentra con el, con el tema de, de cómo mostrar de lo más, más objetivo, porque así llegamos a la, llegas al, al, a la persona que ve el, el documental de una forma, eh, le, lo deja a su criterio, digamos. How do you approach a visual towards their criteria? Y ella siente que, por ejemplo, en la película 34 Sugarman había un enfoque subjetivo al aspecto visual y algunos documentaristas quieren que sea bastante plano, objetivo, realista. Me parece que varía. Existen tantos tipos de documentales y ningún enfoque es particularmente mejor que otro. En 34 Sugarman tengo sensaciones bastante ambiguas. No me parece que sea tan buena como piensan otros. Me parece que es una, una excelente historia, pero está contada de forma un poco deshonesta. Y para mí, los documentales siempre deberían de bueno, enfatizar en lo que deberían de presentarse de forma honesta, porque de una u otra forma los documentales son de la epistemiología, qué entendemos de las cosas, qué comprendemos 
Eso lo dicen porque lo hiding it from us. No, 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 se manipula, se manipula el material, se manipula el material hasta un punto tal en el cual ya no es cierto. No es cierto que este artista nunca haya tocado en el año 1970 y tanto, ha estado en giras por el mundo, pero a menor escala. Y no hablan de eso. Si uno tiene conocimiento, hay que asegurarse de que el público también lo tenga. Ellos retienen cierto conocimiento del público para que la historia sea mejor. Y para mí, es una cuestión difícil. Está bien dejar que el conocimiento se divulgue poco a poco. Eso es parte de contar una historia. Pero no el darle todo el conocimiento al público que uno tiene, eso sería mentir. Eh, we have to wrap up. Maybe one more question that I haven't asked before, and we'll close with the last question. Hi. Um, when I see you, I see Hola, the same energy veo, of the Korean guy that you show on uh, Life in a Day, mm -hmm. the guy who rides día, his bicycle around the world. So my question is, uh, what's the pregunta source of, her, of es all your energy? De I mean, toda tu I think I imagine that me, your work must take a lot of energy in putting de things together, the budget, energía, uh, reunir, filming I think is one of It must be one of the cine, hard things to do because it takes a lot of energy. So what's the source of it? I mean, your love for... I don't know, I think just curiosity about the world. And what's the source of it? I don't know, I think just curiosity about the world. And wanting to experience a lot of the world myself. And I think that's... 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 That's what made me want to do documentaries in the first place. I'm interested in people, interested in lots of different subjects. And it's a privilege as a filmmaker to be able to enter into many different worlds. So whether it be fiction film or non-fiction film, you have to learn about that world. So when I did a film about journalism, I spent a lot of time in that world, imagining what it's like to be a journalist. And maybe you could say that it's that filmmakers in general are people who are people who are people who are people who are y uno podría decir que los cineastas en general son personas que quieren saber lo que es vivir otra vida y no vivir tu propia vida. Así que psicológicamente me pueden juzgar por ahí. Terminamos ya. Hemos estado casi una hora y media con Kevin. Les agradecemos la presencia. Él ha sido uno de los dos invitados que hemos tenido para este festival. Y ciertamente nos interesaba que pudiera conocerse su experiencia, su, su manera de trabajar, su talento. Eh, ojalá que lo hayamos podido aprovechar lo más posible con esta conversación. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you very much.